All right, welcome back, Primal Athletics listeners. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We have Julie Fouché, Dr. Julie Fouché, um, mm-hmm. four-time games athlete, physician at Cleveland Clinic still. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Um, kind of an OG in the CrossFit space, um, been around for a long time, um, host of Pursuing Health podcast, and overall badass. So we, we want to thank Julie for coming on and joining us today to, to pick apart some things here in in lieu of COVID and being at home and trying to find our way through the dust here. So thank you for coming on, Julie. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Us too. (laughs) So I think maybe like to start it off, you can just kind of catch people up. I think maybe some people, uh, the last time they saw you was um, at regionals 2015, which was like one of the coolest moments of uh, (laughs) games history. I think, you know, that uh, when you, tore your Achilles and we're walking on your hand. That was a handstand. That was pretty awesome. Um, so maybe just, can you like catch up what, uh, what you've been up to? Um, you've been doing a lot of cool stuff, obviously. So. Sure. So I, yeah, in 2015 was when I basically officially retired from CrossFit Games competition and I dove back into med school. So I finished two more, two years of med school and then went into three years of family medicine residency and I'm just about to graduate from residency at the end of June. So super excited about that. It's been a long time coming. Um, and that's basically what I've been focused on for the last five years or so. Uh, I've also really loved, um, you guys mentioned the podcast. I started the podcast right around that same time 2015 and that's been a blast for me to do um, just to get to interview people and to keep connecting with the CrossFit community and to see sort of see it evolve as I went from more of an athlete now to more of a doctor and interviewing more people on a variety of health topics and not just um, professional athletes which I still love to do but um, it's been really fun to see that evolve too and and yeah, I think those are the main things. Nice. Are you still training pretty intensely yourself or um, what's your training kind of like these days? Yeah, it's been really, it's evolved over the last five years. I would say the first couple of years, um, I was very diligent about doing, actually, I have an online training program and I was just doing that every day. It's a, basically an hour and we really pack a lot into that hour and I was pretty consistent with it. And I ended up just from all the fitness I built up over the previous, you know, several years, I ended up still being able to go to regionals um, once as an individual and then once on a team, which was really fun for me because it was just a totally different experience without having the pressure of wanting to qualify. And then after that, I would say the last three years being in residency, my training has been a little bit more inconsistent. Um, I joined an affiliate here, which it took me forever to find right affiliate here in Cleveland. I've been here for like nine years and we finally found the perfect one for us. Um, my husband and I a couple of years ago. And so we've been going there and I've just been really enjoying doing the classes and trying to get there as many days a week as I can. Um, I did a little bit more training last year for the rogue invitational. And then this year was starting to, and then all the gyms closed. So I kind of gave up on that and have just been doing home workouts and we don't have much equipment here. We have a, we don't have a garage. So we just have like in our office, we have some dumbbells and kettlebells and a bike and a war, a door mounted pull up bar. So that's mainly what, what I'm doing like 15, 20 minute workouts pretty much. Um, but we, it's been a lot of fun to do them. Like first thing in the morning, my husband and I do it every day and it's been fun. I've definitely been a lot more consistent. (laughs) Nice. Back to the basics. Yeah, exactly. Um, in that pursuing health that you guys are um, pushing, you got this, I guess, kind of philosophy that lifestyle is overall the the bulwark against um, sickness. And that's mm-hmm. kind of falls in line with that. You know, we learned the level one, the sick fit continuum, the furthest, further you are from um, sickness, the fitter you are and vice versa. Is that contrary to maybe uh, what they preach in the, in the health space is, is, uh, you know, have you had resistance to that? Is there backlash to that kind of philosophy? Uh, maybe you could speak on that a little bit as lifestyle is the cure. 
Yeah, it's a great question. So I don't know that so much that I've, that I've felt resistance to it. I think that in general, if you talk to anyone in medicine, like they agree, it's a good idea to be exercising and eating well. And all of these things are the foundation of health. But what I think the conflict or the problem is, is that our healthcare system is not set up in such a way to facilitate those lifestyle changes to happen. So our healthcare system has been based around this insurance model, which reimburses you for office visits. And so you have to see a lot of patients in a short amount of time in order to keep your doors open and pay the bills. And what that means is less time getting to know your patients, less time to talk about things like lifestyle, you know, and so it ends up being a lot of times prescribing medications. And I think the pharmaceutical industry also is like kind of contributed to, to that, just sort of pushing medications as a cure for everything. When in fact, they're really just um, sort of delaying the inevitable. A lot of the chronic diseases, the medications we have don't cure the disease. All they do is make your numbers look okay, but you still have that underlying disease or inflammation going on, um, which is something that I think we've all started to see the significance of with this coronavirus pandemic is the people who are most susceptible to getting really sick from the virus are people who have some form of chronic disease. Um, and it doesn't have to be you know, terribly out of control, even if you have diabetes, but your blood sugars are well controlled on medications, or you have high blood pressure, but your blood pressure looks good because you're taking a medication. You know, it's, it doesn't take away the fact that you're still more susceptible to that severe disease because it's it's really just making the numbers look better. It's not really addressing the underlying cause like the lifestyle changes do. How do you, in your opinion, how can you, how can we maybe change that um, mindset of the public? Like, what what maybe what's a way to get into um, you know changing that paradigm into preaching more of a healthy lifestyle as a bulwark against sickness rather than treating the symptoms, but not the root causes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> it's, I mean, if we had to answer that question, we would be a much healthier country, I think. <laughs> but I think like doing what you are doing every day in the gym is exactly what we should be doing, right? It's, it's showing people what's possible. And the more people, you know, Greg Glassman, the founder of CrossFit always talks about affiliates as being these lifeboats. And the more people that you get on the lifeboat and the more people that you can show the power of, you know, look at what, what you can do if you put in the work and you will feel better and more confident and can maybe come off of medications and all of these things. And then their friends see that, their family members see that, and then they start to maybe think it's possible for them too. But I think right now our culture is just, it's gone so far in the direction of just being like, okay with this status quo of like it's just normal these things are just normal to gain weight as you age or to you know become frail as you age and to have to need help and and it doesn't have to be normal you know that and I think we're showing what's possible in all of the affiliates so I think continuing to do that and trying to expose people who really need it to what's going on in the affiliates that's the trick that I don't I don't know if anyone's really figured that out either but you know, it's one thing to walk in the gym if you have a background working out or playing sports, but it's obviously very intimidating for most people to walk in the gym, even for a lot of people who did play sports before. And so finding a way to break down those barriers so it's not so intimidating and people can see that there are other people like them in the gym and that it is possible for them to, to make those changes and to gain some confidence. Yeah, I think that that's kind of the difference between maybe like if you were to open your own practice um, or if you were to have your own practice, you could almost prescribe lifestyle um, mm -hmm. and you could maybe prescribe, you know, CrossFit, maybe not use the, the word CrossFit, but, and, and people might um, maybe trust the opinion more or something like that. So I guess like how, how would you kind of prescribe lifestyle to someone that came into your office that was maybe, you know, overweight, pre-diabetic? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, like you said, yes, maybe it will have more weight coming from like their primary care doctor, but not always. At the end of the day, like it has to come from the person and you can't force people to do stuff that they're not re ready to do. And a lot of what we do in primary care is just 
building those relationships and helping people work through those stages of change so that maybe they're not ready to make a change right away, but maybe over time, you know, they move a little bit closer. And, and a lot of times it's starting with something really small and gaining some confidence and gaining momentum and then building on that. So for me, it's really trying to figure out like, who is this person and what, what is important to them and what is, what is something that they are going to enjoy doing and be motivated and willing to do and starting there. Um, for some people that might be exercise for some people that might be going to a CrossFit gym where they have a coach that can instruct them for other people that might be terrifying and they want to stay in their house and do a YouTube video workout because they don't want anyone else to see them exercise for the first time. And so a lot of it is just trying to figure out where the person's at and where you're starting from. Um, and then for some people it might not be exercise at all. Maybe it's changing their diet. Maybe it's, you know, coming off soda or quitting smoking or sleeping more or whatever it may be. Um, but it's going to be different for every person. I have a background in physical education, went to school for and taught at the public school level for a while. And I've always had this like inkling of if we could find a way to maybe mix in that as we're talking this lifestyle, um, you know, more health conscious wellness into like, you know, a more prescribed curriculum, maybe even with the CrossFit um, doctrines in it, mm -hmm. then when we have these children that are malleable and we're instilling in them, lifestyle is more, is of utmost importance for longevity and health maybe we could, uh, you know, delay or, or reduce all those things that come on later in life and the lack of exercise and the poor diet and the poor lifestyle choices. That's something I I've always thought about, but it's, there's a lot of, um, I don't know, boundaries to get across, uh, in order to do so. Have you thought about like, you know, CrossFit in the public school space? Oh yeah. And I know, uh, I mean, I think it's, Awesome. I think that it's so much easier to teach kids when they're forming habits and when they're learning about this stuff early on than to start working with adults who have decades of, you know, experience and how things are or what their normal is. So I would 100%, you know, advocate for all of this to happen in schools or with kids who are younger. And I know that there are some people who who are doing it. I don't know specifics. Um, but I know that there are some school systems that are incorporating it. I know there are some teachers that are incorporating it here and there. I don't know if there's any big coordinated efforts, but you know, I think that that's, th there's such an opportunity through childhood education to incorporate a lot of this stuff, even, even just the principles of like that we teach at CrossFit about what are functional movements and how to create a workout and, and what, you know, what to do because so many of us, you know, maybe we played sports and that's our background. And then I know I felt lost when I got to college, even though I played sports growing up, I did gymnastics and I ran track. And unless I was going to go out for a run, um, I didn't really know what to do. And I would go to the gym and just do the machines like everyone else. And I felt really lost. And so imagine if, you know, we equip all these kids with the ability to, know how to create a workout or what are different functional movements, how to use kettlebells, how to use dumbbells, barbells. I mean, then they have these skills for life. Um, and, you know, they may not use them all the time, depending on what phase of life that they're in, but at least they have the tools. Exactly. I always thought that back in the sixties, the JFK presidential challenge yeah. was the coolest thing of all time. You <laughs> see like videos of like the 50 kids in the class doing dips and handstand walks. I'm like, that is freaking sweet so awesome we need to get back to that <laughs> yeah we do <laughs> but kind it is of... a whole family thing too right like I mean schools are a great place because it's you know that's where kids are and that's where they can learn but also as you see adults changing like obviously that's going to change their kid what their kids do too so the earlier you can catch people the better but it also you know so much of what kids are exposed to comes from their home environment too for sure. Kind of along those lines of like exposing people to CrossFit, um, the games has kind of had this like, you know, impacting or inspiring some people to come into the gym, but it also intimidates some people. And you're kind of in a unique situation where you've competed at the highest level of the sport, but then you're also 
you know, health is, is your field. So, um, how, what do you see like the relationship between the sport of CrossFit and the health, um, sphere of CrossFit? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I really, I do separate them because I think that they are two different things. And I think, and I think that it, it was hard at first for people to separate them because of the way that the CrossFit games grew from such a grassroots effort and the way that CrossFit from the beginning has always been sort of competitive. And the way that I separate them is because now to compete in the CrossFit games, these are, you know, the people who are training for hours a day, they're the fittest in the world. And, you know, when we talk about at the level one, creating health or creating fitness over the course of your lifetime, we're looking at that overall lifetime. We're looking at like stretching out that area under the curve. And what you're doing when training for the CrossFit Games is you're trying to have this really steep like increase in fitness as fast as possible so that you can be at your peak maybe when you're in your 20s or your 30s and that's your peak. Um, and I think that it's amazing and it's it's so amazing to see what we're capable of, what we've done over the past 10 plus years to see how we've pushed the envelope of what the human body is capable of is amazing. Um, but I don't necessarily think that what, what you're doing to train for that goal is the healthiest. If you look at looking at health over the course of a lifetime, I think, and, and a lot of this, we don't, you know, we haven't tested it out. We don't have great data because CrossFit people haven't been training like this for that long in the grand scheme of things. But I think that even in the level one, Greg talks about, um, I can't remember the exact wording, but something about fitness as a long trajectory to a distant horizon or something. It's basically improving a little bit every day over the course of your lifetime, as opposed to this like train for five hours a day, super intense workouts, um, really pushing the edge of what you're capable of. Um, just the stress that that puts on the body. Um, not to mention the fact that that's what that's what these athletes are doing full time. So when they're not training, they're recovering versus, you know, if you're trying to do this for health, there's probably other things that you want to do with your life. There's probably other things that you want to be healthy for, like maybe working or being with your family. And, and I just don't think that it's healthy to be kind of burning the candle at both ends training that much and, you know, doing all these other things that you want to do. So at the end of the day, I think it comes down to, thinking about what do you want your fitness for? Is it because you want to train and be the fittest on earth and that's going to be your sole purpose? Or is it so that you can, you know, be really functional as you age and play with your grandkids or, you know, go climb Mount Everest or whatever other goals that you have and trying to keep that in context. And I think for most people and most goals, um, you know, for longevity, we don't need to be training more than one workout a day or like one hour a day for most people. I think it depends on your situation, but in general. Yeah. Do you ever see them like separating the, the, uh, like kind of the two spheres? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think they kind of are now, I think with the new website that they put out with the CrossFit at home series and just the, you know, the, the branding side of things seems to have changed so that you have the games, which looks different from, from CrossFit.com and CrossFit training. I think that they'll always be, they're both very important parts of CrossFit. Um, but I think that it became difficult for the average person to sort of decipher what, what was they were supposed to be doing. And, but that's also part of the, the thing that makes CrossFit so cool. And what makes the CrossFit game so cool is that, you as a recreational CrossFitter know, you kind of have a taste of what these athletes are going through. When they do a workout, you've probably done a workout similar to that or will do a workout similar to that in the future. And you know what it feels like. And you know what it feels like to be, you know, as they're cheering in the last person on the workout, you know what that feels like because it's happened to you at the gym. And I think that's really cool. Um, and so I, I think that that is part of what makes the sport cool. And I, I don't want that to go away. Um, but I think there was just this, this weird phase, like in the middle stages of things as the CrossFit Games was becoming more of a professional sport and more people were coming in where everyone thought that if they wanted to be 
you know, the best thing to do is just to train lots of volume and multiple hours a day, which um, I don't think is necessarily the healthiest way for the long run. Yeah. And yeah. I think we're, we're figuring out on the fly too. Cause it, like, if you just look at CrossFit in terms of its lifespan, it's like still in its yeah. infancy, you yeah, know, compared yeah. to any other sport. So like we are in ways, guinea pigs of the methodology still right. even now. Um, so it, it, it's, you know, it's formative and, um, it's fun to explore and, and experience, you know, obviously people have gone to that peak and people who are doing it for general fitness. Um, it has many places. Mm -hmm. And it will change for all of us over the course of our lives. Like what does it look like for us? It's going to be different, but I think like we talked about earlier, once you have those principles in place and like, you know, how to move, I think that it's going to serve you in whatever your goal is in that stage of life. As far as like COVID, how, um, how kind of familiar or how close to your studies are you um, with it? Like, can you, like, would you say um, like CrossFit would help your chances of surviving COVID or? Well, I don't know that we can make claims like that, but I think that in general, like we talked about earlier, if you're, you know, people who are going to do better and who are not going to be affected by the coronavirus are people who are generally healthier, who do not have chronic disease, um, in general, who are younger. So doing things to, to protect yourself from chronic disease, like exercise, like CrossFit, like eating well, eating real foods, avoiding sugar and processed foods, eating lots of good proteins and vegetables. Um, getting enough sleep, doing something to down-regulate or minimize, like, minimize the impact of stress, um, having good relationships, with, which CrossFit also helps you do with the community that we have. All of those things are going to help you to be healthy. And as a result, if you get infected with the coronavirus, it's not going to be as likely to make you really sick. Yeah. And if, if you were to have... Like if you owned an affiliate, how would you how would you set up an affiliate to be like a safe space for people to work out like while this is still kind of going on? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if I'm the best person to, an to answer this because I don't have an affiliate, so I haven't done as much research on it. But I think for right now, um, you know, and it is as I think as each of the states are relaxing their stay at home orders, what we're seeing is at first people you know, trying to continue some social distancing. So making sure that your gym isn't going to be packed with people sweating next to, you know, right next to each other. they are going to be able to keep about six feet apart while you're working out. So having more space than we're used to, you know, not being able to do like the high fives and the fist bumps like we normally do, which is a big bummer. Um, making sure that we're all practicing good hand hygiene. So washing our hands, you know, it's going to be hard for people to, to remember, like, don't touch your mouth or your face in the middle of the workout when you're sweating and can't think straight. But as much as you can, trying to avoid touching your face is the biggest way to prevent any spread of infection. And then I think that the, the thing that really it, it falls on the individual member is to just be honest with themselves and think about the other people. So if, if they're starting to feel sick, if they're starting to have a cough or not feeling quite right, like just stay home um, and just see how it pans out and do that with the idea that you're trying to protect your community. Normally, I think during respiratory season, a lot of people will just sort of push through if they have a cough or something going on, but just recognizing that this is a little different situation. And in the wake of coronavirus, like after this, I don't know when it will end, but after, after things settle out, um, how can we maybe as health professionals, as um, people in the, in the fitness space, how can we capitalize on like this fertile soil that will be left to maybe press that lifestyle philosophy? Um, you know, with this fresh in people's minds and people getting sick and obviously chronic diseases as cofactors, how can we maybe capitalize on that fertile soil in your opinion? Yeah. I mean, this is a great question too, that I think, I think that we should all be trying to capitalize on it because I think a lot of things are going to change even after this. I think things are going to be different in terms of 
our healthcare system. I hope there'll be some things that will change for the better. Um, I hope that, that the general public will, will think a little bit harder about their lifestyle and what implications it has on their long-term health. Um, and so I think people will hopefully be more receptive to starting something. And I think we've already seen, you know, some people maybe getting started at their house, like if their family members are doing workouts at home and maybe they're joining in. And, and so I think having avenues for people to start in very small ways, whether it's starting to do home workouts or whether it's doing, um, you know, more like a more um, drawn out on ramp session or something where people are going to feel really comfortable and less intimidated by coming in. Um, people being able to bring in their friends and family. Um, yeah, I think, I think that this is actually a good thing for us in that we can, we hopefully will be able to have a more receptive audience for those people who maybe have chronic diseases or um, are at highest risk. So, I mean, I'm hoping it will work out for the best, but I don't know. <laughs> it's something I think we have to all figure out. I think you're on the money with that. Like the, the at home workout Avenue and providing, you know, we've been providing like at home workouts to people who aren't even members, like putting them out to the community and, yeah, and people being at home and, you know, minimal equipment using backpacks running out on the street. I, I've seen more people jogging in my neighborhood in the past three weeks than I have my entire life. And I'm oh like, my gosh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and, and everyone's just, going for their daily walks. And <laughs> right. It's been great. So I hope that again, as you do, if we're optimistic, that's going to, you know, keep the snowball rolling in the right direction. And it, maybe we just needed a fire under our ass to get people off the couch. Yeah, I hope so. I hope that this is, this is, will serve that purpose for sure. Eric, you got uh, any more questions for Julie? Uh, no, I think that was a lot of good info. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we, thank you, guys. Again, we appreciate okay, yeah. having you. Um, thank you for giving us your time tonight. And our members are definitely going to be appreciative of, of hearing your input on a lot of things that we talked about tonight. Awesome. Well, thank you. I hope you guys all stay safe and healthy and that you'll be able to go back and work out in the gym with all your members soon where can yeah. people find you online if they're looking for you julie um i'm at pursuing-health.com there's a dash in the middle but we um that's where you can find the podcast and everything else that we're doing so sweet check it out people Very stay cool. healthy keep moving we'll see you next time sounds good thank you guys thank you, thank you julie